Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Jeff Anderson, and I'm watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. <laughs> yes, you are. And so is everybody else. Hey, Jeff. How's it going, guys? It's so it good is great to, to see you. Here. You were yeah. uh, our guest on episode number five of this My of this good. Show. And what episode is this? 1300 something. Oh, my goodness. Wow. When, when you're not, yeah. no longer so precious by even the hundreds, you just kind of like, oh, shit. We went we, by 1300. Like, we stopped sort of even focusing on it because. The one thing we can do is make that number go bigger constantly. So yes. I don't know what it is today, but it's way the fuck up there. That is awesome. Museum and the Smithsonian exhibit exists. If, you know, as long as they list the top five or the first five, then then, then I've secured my spot. <laughs> I, right. I will say this last week, uh, we we finally, without specifically trying, we finally got our EGOT, our guest EGOT. So, oh, nice. we, yeah, we got our, our our last piece, which was the Oscar. And wow. so, you know, it's uh, the top five is getting real crowded up there, Jeff. <laughs> like I said, maybe not top five, but at least first five, right? There's always something to be first in. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So the last time that you were with us, you um, it came to my house and you showed us something that we thought was a really neat idea. You had a stock certificate um, with you for a song that uh, Dwayne Wiggins had written. That's um, right. Yeah. And uh, It's a Beautiful Thing was the title of that song. And you allowed uh, listeners and fans of Tony, Tony, Tony and Dwayne Wiggins to purchase shares of that song. Yep. Um, we thought that was a fantastic idea. What has what has evolved from that idea? Well, it's 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 funny. I would say two things. So first of all, when we had that interview, I was running the New York Rock Exchange, and um, you know that was an idea that uh, I, I still think uh, it's actually even more epic today because if you think about it, what what I was showing you right was the you idea. predated NFTs. You owned a share of the song, right? Not in a financial way where you get royalties. And so yeah. it was a pre-blockchain NFT. We were literally just like, you know, four years too early with it. And so it's uh, it's it's been amazing to see that space evolve and just explode over the past year. And I think, to be honest, the idea behind the New York Rock Exchange is just as powerful as it's ever been and probably more accessible because now people get it. You don't have to explain what it is there. You know, everybody gets what an NFT is. So, um, but what that ultimately led to, to answer your question is uh, the next company, which was Legion M. So, you know, that we ended up uh, in about uh, late 2015, kind of winding down the New York rock exchange. Um, it, we had had some great success. We did some things that we were really proud of, but it just it never kind of took off. You know, like I said, I think we were just about four years too early. Um, but what we did was, you know, one of the things that we had learned through the process of that company was this whole um, equity crowdfunding, which was a, a whole brand new uh, sphere, a brand new suite of laws that had never existed before that enabled some things that had never been possible before. And uh, that led to Legion M, which is the current thing that I've been working on since 2016. So, you know, almost six years now, uh, which is we're the world's first fan owned entertainment company. We're building a Hollywood studio that is designed from day one to be owned by fans, not in an NFT sort of way, but in a real stock sort of way where you own a piece of the company if we're successful you know, that you can make money the same way that you would have made money if you were one of the first investors in, in Walt Disney Studios. Very ahead, intriguing. John. Yeah. I, you know, I love the idea. And I think that with the uh, proliferation of 
content that comes from independent studios nowadays and the fact that Hollywood sort of uh, has been demonopolized. Uh, I think now you're in the right place and, and the New York Rock Exchange was a great primer um, for what you're doing. And, and the fact that you're taking something that was based on the uh, community ownership of a song and now you're branching out into community ownership of a studio and all of its properties. I, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. What, uh, tell us what you foresee um, as this thing starts to grow. What does ownership in the studio mean for a, for a fan and a viewer like, like me or Pete? Yeah. So it's, it's a great, and first of all, you're, you're, you're totally right, you know, on your first point. And it's, it's kind of like, this is the life of an entrepreneur, right? Anytime you start a company, yeah. the odds are against you. And, you know, um, uh, this is Legion M is now my third startup. And the way that I see it, I've got one win, right. From Moby TV. That was the company that Paul and I launched back in 1999. We were the first ones to live TV on a cell phone. You know, that one was, a was an undisputed win. Uh, the New York rock exchange, like I said, we were in business for what, six years. We generated time employed people you know contributed to society you know all that sort of stuff but uh, ultimately it didn't take off um and legion m is 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 attempt number three and so you know and and so far it's off you know stronger than in either the first two including Moby tv the one that was really successful and so you know um i say all that because when you ask what's in it for a guy like you or Pete, if you wanted to invest, it's that. It's coming along for the ride. You know, we are literally an early stage startup. It's, uh, you know, what the Jobs Act changed was that for the first time, it gave regular people the opportunity to invest in a startup like this, which before was impossible. Uh, before, if, even if you lived next door to Mark Zuckerberg when he's pitching you on his idea and he's like, hey, man, I just need $5,000 to buy some servers, um, you actually weren't allowed to invest in that company unless you were what's called an accredited investor, which is effectively the wealthiest few percent of the population. And so... Um, the, uh, you know, the Jobs Act changed that. In 2016, the SEC kind of, you know, realized that we live in a different age. You know, th these laws, these securities laws were written back in the 1930s, and they were largely designed to protect just average consumers because in, that, in those days, uh, people with wealth had access to information and advice um, that was not accessible. If you were a small town farmer, you had no idea if the, you know, this entrepreneur coming into town trying to sell you something was selling you something real or selling you something completely fake. And so they put these laws in place to protect, um, you know, kind of mainstream investors. But, you know, flash forward to 2022 and we got access to more information on our cell phone than, you know, the richest guy in the world did back in the 1930s. And so um, they democratized it and they opened it up. And so now for the first time, anybody has the opportunity to invest in a startup at the earliest stages. And, you know, like I said, uh, investing in a startup is a real swing for the fence. You know, statistically, the most likely outcome is that you're going to lose all your money because nine out of 10 startups fail, like period. Like that's just the facts. But that was the fact when Jeff Bezos was starting up Amazon out of his garage. That was the fact when Walt Disney was starting Disney. You know, it's like most people fail, but the ones that succeed can change the world. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to be a part of that as an investor, it can mean, you know, breathtaking financial returns, um, as well as just, I, you know, all the joy that comes from making a contribution like that. The same sort of thing that powers Kickstarter. I mean, people, you know, back projects, they put billions of dollars a year into Kickstarter, not because they want to, you know, they're expecting a financial return, but because they want to be a part of something that can truly change things. And I think that's what's powerful about equity crowdfunding and, and Legion M is that it, it, it's really, it's both of those. Like you can literally be the difference between something happening or not happening. And if it does happen, you also get to participate in the upside. And I think that's, what's really exciting. One of the things that's crazy about uh, Amazon, you just mentioned them. I invested to them in the mid, mid nineties, if you can believe that. And somewhere as an account, somewhere with some shares in it, it's almost like having Bitcoin, an old hard drive that you can't find anymore. Right. Um, and, and maybe I will find that, but, those shares today are worth way, 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 way more than I bought them. Um, and and uh, they're going to split 20 ways. And so what does that do? 
that means that now anybody can buy a full share, you know, of Amazon again, because it will be, uh, be affordable. In the history of all of these things, and I don't want to say this too, I was reading up on Margaret Thatcher today and, and you know, the old iron lady sometimes, you know, gets hit hard. Sometimes she doesn't. One of the things she did accomplish though, was she got um, folks in England to develop personal wealth and the amount of money invested per person went from like 5% to 80 plus percent. And so an idea of fractional ownership or, you know, small stage early investment, these things weren't even available because it was people with giant pots of money saying, yes, I can do that. But but it, the market really has evolved into a spot where I have a device on my phone, an app on my phone called Bumped. And the products that I continuously use, every time I use it, I get ah, 1%. Every time I get gas, I get 2% back in Chevron stock. And so it's a bit of a loyalty purchasing program, but over time, it just stacks up. And look, it's not a lot of money. I don't buy a lot of things, but it's Verizon. It's, you know, Sam's Club, all these places where you can go and you're reinvesting some of that, that personal uh, incentive to go back and buy their McDonald's is one of them that I use, right? So I pick McDonald's over to the other uh, fast food because I, I get this little bit of a share back. And then over time, I mean... I'm not doing anything different. Maybe I'm going to a different brand more often than I would otherwise. But, um, you know, it's like a hundred bucks in there. And it's just, that's awesome. Yeah. That's a great like, idea for an app. Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. So we have the same thing. We're like, I love movies. I want to invest in movies and you can literally, and right now I'm going to do it while we're live on the air. I'm going to invest in, in your company, you know? And awesome. Well, that's, no, I, I, I mean, I think you, you really hit the nail right on the head, Pete. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's, it's this idea that, um, you know, fans, you and I and the people listening and watching, like at the end of the day, we're the ones that have the power in the entertainment industry. Because if you think about it, it's our wallets and eyeballs that generate every penny of revenue that makes, you know, Netflix worth $100 billion, and Disney worth, you know, $300 billion and all that sort of stuff. It all comes from us. And so as individuals, we're just consumers. There's nothing that we can do. Our opinions don't matter, you know. Um, but when we unite, we've got the power literally to move the industry. And so, you know, the Legion M logo is an M with a bar over it, which is the Roman numeral for 1 million. And we did that. We built that in from day one into our logo, uh, our long term goal, which is to unite one million fans as shareholders of the company, because we believe that an entertainment company that's literally owned that has a legion of a million fans behind it has this incredible power in the marketplace. So, you know, like that's what the Legion M proposition is all about. And so. For us as a company, it's about how well can we execute on that? Can we actually fulfill that? How, how does that end up working, practically speaking? And how can we overcome all the, you know, challenges that are inherent with any company, um, you know, to succeed? But it's like we really live at this kind of magical time, I think, which is new. And I, I just last night, I'm at South by Southwest right now. That's why I'm, I'm dialing in from the hotel room here. But I watched the movie called Diamond Hands, The Legend of Wall Street Bets which is all about the GameStop phenomena and, you know, how a bunch of, you know, idiots on Reddit, I'm using a direct quote from the movie, literally moved the markets like in a very significant way and broke Robinhood, the app, so bad that it created this controversy. They had to shut down trading. They they took Melvin Capital, which is this famous, you know, hedge fund um, and you know, dramatically impacted their behavior. And it's just like we live at this time where we have the power as as small individuals, we've got this power, this unprecedented power to unite and to move markets and to literally change the world. And I think, you know, if you look at GameStop, like we could have a whole discussion about that. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think like they were trying to change the world. Like it was just like it wasn't like the best way to do it. Right. You know, because it's, you know, a lot of people were in GameStop because they wanted to give the finger to wall street and, and they wanted to, you know, take back for the little guy. And, you know, the problem is, is that fundamentally, you know, if you've got uh, $50 billion um, going into GameStop stock, none of that actually goes to the company. None of that makes the company a better company. Like the company doesn't, Fundamentally, on day one and day two, the company doesn't change. It's still a failing brick and mortar business. You know, the fact that there were eighty million dollars that came into uh, worth of trading that pushed the stock price way up to here, 
it, it doesn't benefit and no value is actually created. You're just trading. And for everybody that gains a hundred bucks, you know, or actually really for everybody that gains a million dollars, there's like a million investors that lost a dollar, right? And and it's just this kind of actual sort of thing. Whereas if you think about equity crowdfunding, and again, Legion M is just one example. There are probably hundreds, I'm maybe thousands of companies out there right now that are raising money from the crowd to solve problems. Everything from, you know, we're trying to use it to revolutionize Hollywood. There's companies that are creating, you know, alternative energy um, uh, uh, sources and storage and robotics and biotech and, you know, apps and like, like everything. But, you know, if, if $80 billion funneled into one of those companies now that company has the you know the financial wherewithal to go out and to hire the people and to you know to build what they're trying to build or to make the movies that we're trying to make and literally change the world and so it's this 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 idea that you know if you can unite fans to create value and then turn and sell that to wall street like that's the biggest screw you to wall street of all time right because at the end of the day like that's that's what the common people have been blocked out of, you know, for the past hundred years. You know, it's like the, the system is kind of rigged so that the, the rich get richer. And part of it is because of the fact they have access to the alternative things. And, you know, you, you and I, we read to buy Facebook once it got once the company was worth a hundred billion dollars. But that whole value growth between zero when, when Facebook was started and a hundred billion dollars when it IPO'd, all that. That was the exclusive domain of, you know, the wealthiest few percent of the country. And I think that that's that's what's just really exciting. It's this this uniting fans and changing the world. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, we're, we're trying, you know, we're not trying to cure cancer, which w- would be a really cool thing to do. But we think that this idea of giving fans a stake in Hollywood and entertainment and something that consume, you know, is so, you know, so much a part of our lives and an industry that we are entirely responsible for is really healthy. I want to, if I can sneak in a question before John goes, I want to, I want to ask, because there's, there's another aspect to this marketplace that I think is is fantastic. We had Michael Uslin, um, Uslin on the show the other day. And for those that don't know, he basically invented the modern Batman and ultimately is one of the, uh, gosh, not even plank holders. He's one of the trees where they build the planks from to make this modern superhero movie universe. And he even says, for good and for bad, right? So he goes to, I think it was Warner Brothers, to acquire the rights because he was a comic book kid, you know, in the early late 50s, early 60s. And he realized the power of these things. So he goes to Warner Brothers and he's like, hey, I'd like to buy the rights to your DC catalog that you guys own. And they're like, it's not worth anything. And so the, so much so they devalued it. This is the company that owns this thing, by the way. They devalued it so much that they literally gave him the rights to Swamp Thing. You know, and then he goes and makes this movie for like not for free, but the rights were free. And then he was able to buy for a relatively small amount of money that a guy with no background in making movies can borrow. Right. And he was able to buy this DC thing. So every single DC base, basically every single DC movie has got his name as an executive producer and he's made a mountain of money. So that's created this, uh, this demand for these movies. And then he, one of the things he was saying is like, Movie companies really nowadays toy companies and all these alternate product companies. And so they're really more a marketing tool than they are. It's like not that they're not great movies, but they've got so many different things to lift up. We've lost touch from what a great movie is. And so someone who's trying to make a new movie or different movie has to go to different places for funding because I don't need four hundred million dollars to make this thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you don't have to make two hundred million dollars of gross or net you know, to, to justify my movie, let's just go make a few million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I believe that you're, what you guys are doing also incentivizes that where an actor's like, I want to make my own movie. I want to put my own money. I mean, we all know the story like of Ivan Reitman and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito making the most money on the movie. They self-funded. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, I mean, you bring up a great, so first of all, Michael is amazing. You know, we've worked with him on a couple projects and he, he, he knows his stuff. He's an amazing storyteller. And like, I could listen to that guy all day because he just knows so much and he's so good and so relatable. But uh, um, yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's weird because again, everything is a little bit off kilter still because of COVID uh, obviously, but even going into COVID, theatrical releases, you know, you think of going to see a movie in a theater was really struggling. And, you know, streaming has become so dominant. 
And but the, the the models are actually very different. And so if you think of like the traditional film world um, and getting people out to theaters, the, the the model in that case kind of you know where it evolved to was that the most reliable way to get people into a theater is to go big. It was like a go big or go home sort of model. And the thing that I, I think a lot of people don't realize, like I never realized this until I got into the business, is how, you know, how big a factor risk plays into decision making in Hollywood. Because at the end of the day, somebody has to write a check that says, I'm going to spend, you know, 100 million, 10 million, 5 million, right? Are you ready to write a $5 million check? And even if it's not your money, you're working for a studio, you're effectively putting your job on the line. And saying, like, I believe that this film is going to work and, you know, we're going to make money on it. And the safest way to do that is to um, attach it to a large IP, Batman, Harry Potter, something like that. Because you know that when the next Harry Potter movie comes out, you know, or whatever it is, you know, there, there's going to be a, a baked in audience that's going to see it no matter what. Um, and uh, and to put big stars in it, because you know that it, when when uh, The Rock is in a movie, people are going to come out and see him. Um, and like, you know, $100, $200 million on a movie and then spend two or $300 million promoting it around the world so that every bus bench is covered and every single person on planet Earth knows that it's coming. And that is like literally the most reliable way to make money. And it doesn't matter if the movie's any good. <laughs> you know, what matters is that you get those ingredients in there because then people are going to come see it. And even if the movie's terrible, I mean, obviously if the movie's good, then it's like, it's, it's amazing. But even if the movie's bad, you're not going to lose your shirt. And so I think what that ends up doing is it really freezes out and makes it very difficult to try and do original ideas, uh, original IP, original stories. We've talked with we talked with Dean Devlin, the guy that wrote uh, Independence Day uh, with Will Smith and created a franchise out of that. He also wrote uh, Stargate. Uh, the original Stargate movie, which started a, a, a franchise. And he told us, he's like, I couldn't do Independence Day today. Like if I tried to pitch Independence Day today, they'd be like, oh, well, let's make it War of the Worlds and then we can do it. Right. Because, you know, like that's just the mentality. And so, you know, if, if you look back 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, almost every every uh, like look at the list of top 20 movies from 20 years ago. They're all original pictures, right? You know, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jaws, like all these original stories. You look at it today, it's like literally eight out of the top 10 will be reboots or franchises or sequels. And so it's, it's, but, but again, like that kind of gets back to the core of Legion M because if we can unite, if we've got a body of people that are going to come out and see our story, no matter what, then that gives us the advantage. And that, oh, you know, our, our hope is, is that it opens the door to more creative ideas and allowing creators to think outside the box and break the formula and do things that a traditional Hollywood, you know, studio couldn't just simply because of the fact that we're owned by fans. I mean, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that if, 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 if I go, if I've got two movies, I got a proposition, I've got, okay, this movie is going to make 4.7% more revenue, right. And profit over its, over its run. This movie is going to be fucking badass and change the world, right? The studios have to go with the money and it's not because they're evil. It's because of the fact that this, you know, that their, their, their owners are the stock market. Right. That's where your retirement fund is, your IRA, you know, all that sort of stuff. So you frankly want them working to maximize your money. Like that's why all of those people are investing. In our case, you know, if we got a million fan owners, they're going to be like, yeah, let's do something cool. Right. And again, it's, it's it, because for them, that's part of the reward that they get out of it. And so I like the fact that within our community, we feel like we've got more latitude to do things that are kind of off the beaten path. Because again, we also know that that's how true originality is where the reward comes from, right? You know, like, like making a sequel is safe, but if you can create a new IP that then becomes a franchise, like that's where the real potentially interesting value comes from. Fair enough. Uh, I don't know that I agree with Pete that that it's a stifler of creativity that that the superhero movies have done that. I think it certainly exaggerates the 
it's all of the hero's journey. And if you have a built-in hero that people are attached to, it exaggerates that, but you still have to compete with others. And I would also say that superhero movies have been pretty good. Yeah. I don't think they've suffered from poor storytelling. Well, at least the Marvel ones. <laughs> yeah, the Marvel ones. Okay. So uh, given that you have created this environment that gives you some additional latitude, you still only have a slate of movies that is, I don't know how many, but you know, one of the things that people forget to consider in in the decision process, and well, they just decide to make these movies that they think are going to make all this money. Yeah, I think... I remember Paramount make makes 12 movies a year. That's a very finite number of movies. Yeah. So, you know, are you pointed towards a model where your creative latitude is going to be driven such that you're going to make a wider slate with more movies in it? Or are you also saying, well, you know what? We're going to really choose wisely. We're going to take that latitude. We're going to, you know, do our best to create franchises that, that fans can get attached to, but we still can only make a very finite number of movies too. Wh which direction do you like? Well, it's uh, it, it, first of all, it's a really good point, John. And, and, and I, I, I definitely, you know, should acknowledge that people who are making the movies, even when they're sequels and reboots and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody, I think in this day and age, there's not a lot of companies, you know, that are just checking in to make a movie and they're like, oh yeah, we don't care about the movie and that sort of stuff. Like everybody cares. And I think what you've seen, it's interesting because the superhero genre has completely taken over. But what you've seen is all these different variants on it, right? You know, where now it's like, oh, you've got a horror superhero film and you've got like a really you know, comedic superhero film and, you know, film, you know, superheroes become less of like a genre and more of just like, I don't know, like a palette that can be extended to all these different, you know, you could have a superhero rom-com, <laughs> you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. And so, um, but I think, you know, for, for us, it's, um, we, we, we are not averse to those sorts of films and we love, you know, frankly, the franchise. I mean, a lot of our community comes from Comic-Con, which is a celebration of those franchises uh, and that sort of thing. So where I think what we hope, though, is that, you know, we can create space in addition to that. So, like, we don't want everything to be a franchise movie and everything to be a superhero movie. Um, we really like, well, and, and particularly a licensed existing superhero movie. Um, one of the one of the films that we released, uh, it came out about a year, year and a half ago, was Arch Enemy, which starred Joe Manganiello. And that was a movie that we invested in um, that is, you know, somewhat a superhero movie. You know, the whole premise is that Joe Manganiello plays this kind of drunk old bum that claims to be a superhero from another dimension. And, you know, it, but, you know, came to earth and lost his powers. And, you know, so nobody believes him except for this like kid who kind of runs across him and for some reason looks up to him and, and believes him. And the movie is about that and about trying to figure out like, well, who actually is this guy? And, you know, you know aside from the, the super power part of being a superhero, you know, what about like just the hero part of it, you know, and how can you be a hero even if you don't have powers and that sort of thing. And so it's, it's, um, you know, that for us was like an interesting take, uh, you know, that we did that, that had a, um, uh, a superhero kind of bent to it. But like I said, I think our goal really more than anything else is to, at the end of the day, we want to try and create new franchises because, you know, that's really what the opportunity is. And so, um, you know, plus, frankly, Marvel's not calling us to invest in their sequels because they, they've got all the money. They've got everything that they need. They don't they don't need us, um, at least not yet. Once we get to a million shareholders, maybe uh, maybe then they'll start calling us. Well, Orson Welles famously said that the hero of cinema is lack of limitation. And so I think that really what you're talking about in terms of the way that you're structuring the filmmaking process, the investment process is that you're embracing this limitation and saying, let's, let's uh, tackle it together. And yep. so the spirit of that is, is terrific. Um, I, I have a hard out, so I have to, so I have to run, but uh, I really enjoy what you're doing. I really have uh, 
a, a great amount of um, admiration for the mission of you know making film by the people and uh, and for the people. Uh, but I do want to ask you, what does it mean to have William Shatner on your advisory board now? It's awesome. Uh, you know, he's an amazing person. It's funny because I, I, I wouldn't consider myself like a Trekkie uh, or, you know, like I wasn't like a huge William Shatner fan going in. Like, I, obviously, I knew of him like everybody else. And I had generally good impressions. Um, but I've gotten a chance to you know meet him a number of times and work with him now on some projects. And he is a fascinating, fascinating human being. Uh, he's 90 years old and my gosh, his work ethic would put all of us to shame. Like he just, he works nonstop. Um, he, 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 he shows up prepared for everything. He's still sharp as attack. He is still an amazing, uh, storyteller. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we're super excited to have him on board. He, he, he joined for all the right reasons. Uh, you know, he's a, He's a Legion M advisor. He's not being paid. He's not a spokesperson. Like he's got some equity in the company, which will only have value if we are successful starting from where we are now. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's in it with us for all the right reasons. He un obviously understands fans and uh, uh, we hope to have a lot of great projects that we can announce, uh, you know, uh, about him. Nothing, nothing can talk about yet but a, a lot of great discussion just a great guy as far as being able to bounce ideas off of and, and talk to about stuff that's terrific hey i do have to run great to see you though great thanks to a see lot, you man. john and uh good sorry luck we on the mission do this in your house again this time but uh <laughs> maybe next time we can do it I, I don't know if break it down ever goes on location at at, at south by or uh you know sundance or uh comic con but we'll have to we'll have to set a date sometime we will to meet up with you yeah. awesome. see you guys so let me so we'll jump back in here uh before we go to any further though let me just say this uh if you're interested in supporting legion m just go to super simple type in legionm.com. And then there you can read all about it. And not just William Shatner on the board and a lot of very notable stars involved in projects. If you go there, you'll look and you'll see, and you'll get wild. Like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to invest some money in this. I don't have that much money. I'm going to invest some money in this because, you know, I really believe in this thing. And I don't fault the storytelling of the comic book characters. I fault the, um, the lack for force of creativity. Uh, it is the same story over and over again. I don't particularly care for superhero movies because I've seen them all before. So after you see a couple of them. So I do want to see thrillers again and mm -hmm. other, you know, movies that can't be made otherwise. And I, I love that. One of the things that you're also doing. Oh, and by the way, if you want to support the Break It Down Show, uh, here's what you can do. You can go to BreakItDownShow.com and go into the PayPal link and just invent your own subscription. If there's something that you want me to do or you just wanted to support what I do, five bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks a month. Um, look, if there's a thousand of you that do that, I, I'm able to focus solely on the show and just invent a best a lot of money. And I too would like to do some production projects, but I've got to build up a budget to do that. So marketing, all these other things, when you're small, like I am, it doesn't take much. So 15 bucks a month, going to that PayPal link. I don't, I don't need Patreon. I need you and me, and then I'll get to work. If you trust my work ethic, uh, well, then we'll be all right. So that's my ask to you all. Let me get back to Jeff. Jeff, if you put a million fans together, not only do you have a powerful financial engine, not only do you have the ability to go to whoever it is, United Artists or whatever, you also have this built-in audience of people that are like deeply invested in your guys' success. And what a great, this is a third facet to your model. Like, hey, we are um, owned by fans and there's a lot of them and they want to support the projects we put out. Would you guys like to put more money behind this to make this next movie or whatever it is? That's brilliant. Yeah, no, thank you. It's um, it, it's really been uh, amazing because I think that a lot of people just understand this idea intuitively that if you've got an entertainment company owned by fans, like that can make a difference. When your movie comes out opening night, you've got a legion of people that are going to come out and support it. Um, and like we're going in, that was really kind of what we were thinking about. But one of the things that we've realized is that having a legion of fans also opens a lot of doors in Hollywood. Uh, I'm perfectly honest. We would not 
be talking with William Shatner if this was just Paul and Jeff, you know, and some guys that had some money in Hollywood. Uh, Stan Lee, we worked with Stan Lee in the in the for a couple of years before he passed away. Uh, Kevin Smith, those are all people that would not. I mean, they don't need our money. Uh, and we frankly, I mean, as a company, we've raised fifteen million dollars, which is a lot of money, but in the world of Hollywood, it's literally a drop in the bucket. Right. Um, and so. I think that you know, we, because of the fact that when we go to creator, we're not like, hey, we're a conglomerate that wants to make some money and, you know, let's talk about what we can do. We are, we, we go to people and we are representing right now 35,000 people that have given us their money and we've pooled our money because we want to make this project happen and we want to work with you. And that has proven to be a very powerful uh, sort of tool. And so we got way out of our league when it comes to uh, uh, working with people. And we're, you know, that's been really exciting. You know, the other thing that, again, was not that intuitive to us going in was ways that we can harness the power of that community to help with the actual production um, of, of things. And there's just countless examples where, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's tricky. You know, you got to figure out the right way to do it because, uh, you know, we are, our, our internal saying is like, you don't make great art by committee, right? You know, like we're, we're not going to have a democracy where we vote on like plot points and that sort of stuff, because I, I think that's just a route to disaster. Now, and nobody's ever going to agree. And at the end of the day, you make great art, by finding great artists and empowering them and staying out of their way. And so that that's our philosophy. But there have been many different ways um, where we, for example, in that movie art I was talking about, we put the call out to our legion and uh, the director was looking to rent a car, a picture car for it, for the uh, hero to drive. It was going to be kind of the centerpiece vehicle. He wanted something really cool and distinctive. And uh, he had an idea. He wanted like a late model Dodge Charger, you know, black, you know, like really pimped out. And so we asked people like, hey, if you've got a cool car that kind of fits that um, fits that vibe, submit it. And uh, uh, we had a whole bunch of people submit. And the guy that ended up winning had, it wasn't even anywhere near that. It was like a 1970s El Camino, but kick-ass El Camino. And the director's like, oh, my God, that's better than I would have ever even asked for. And so, um, you know, we talked to the guy, and he was a mechanic, and, and he, you know, took a, a week off of work and came and worked out on the set and managed uh, his vehicle. And uh, so his, his car is in the movie and it's like, you know, a, a fairly prominent role in the movie. And then, you know, not only that, but his experience with that led him to pursue more work like that and completely shifted his career. So now like that's literally what he does. He manages picture cars. Uh, he's like, a, you know, a, a, a mechanical consultant, you know, when it comes to vehicles. Uh, he's starting to do some training to learn how to do stunts. And, you know, it's all because he kind of got his foot in the door and then was able to network. And so, um, again, like that's just one of the uh, almost countless examples that we find every day where being owned by fans creates differences and competitive, competitive advantages that we think will make Legion M more successful uh, in the future and just, you know, creates opportunity for the people that are a part of it. We had uh, David Michael Latt, I believe that is his name, and they're from Trauma Studios. And okay, just to prove that you can make money a lot of different ways in Hollywood, they're the folks that made all of the Sharknado type movies. Yep. You know, uh, teenage high school cheerleader zombie penitentiary. You know, whatever. Yeah. It is. And and they they do the opposite of Paramount. They make a hundred movies a year. Yep. And they don't go for five stars. They go for two and they don't go back and reshoot something because what they just shot was good. And they're like, a, look, you know what you're going to go on. It's like a roller coaster and people love roller coasters. And so they just go out and they build really good roller coasters and they go out and they constantly produce this, you know, these, these great movies that are preposterous and ridiculous, but they also make a lot of money doing this. So that, that I guess, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach this and many, many ways to, to make money in, in the movie industry, if you're allowed in, how has your guys's access grown um, as you as you've been on this journey externally like to approach? You know, a movie gets greenlighted a lot easier if there's a star attached to it. 
you know, these, these other incredible people. Okay. William Shatner opens doors, these things. How has your access grown at Legion M? Sorry, uh, Pete, you just broke up for a second. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The um, access that you guys have developed, we talked about David Michael Latt and Trauma Studios and how they make, you know, as many movies as possible in a month. That's ridiculous. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. But one of the things you have to develop is that access. You kind of alluded to it already. But how has that evolved? When you go knocking on somebody's door, gosh, I think I might have lost Jeff again here. Well, we'll just keep going. Um, can you hear me, Jeff? Hold on. Yeah, I can still hear you, but it's it's really like, um, give me just one second. I'm switching over to a yeah. different Wi-Fi network. All right. I'm going to let Jeff talk and I will fill in the gaps. So Jeff was on a long time ago and Jeff had this really cool classic car. And when we were talking about the New York Rock Exchange, again, that's a program where you could buy into a an artist's uh, new project and sort of like, it's sort of like a fan club plus. Ah, here comes Jeff. Hey, Jeff, I was talking about access. And how has your access grown? You know, it's one thing, like I had a friend that said, hey, I've got this great idea for a reality show. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. The idea is like the least important thing in this equation. Is your idea attached to someone who can already get meetings? You know, these things, these are the keys to Hollywood, right? It's not just an idea or IP. It's, it's, uh, it's the other aspects of it. Like, have you built up an, a Hollywood audience that can get you into the room to make a pitch? Nope. <laughs> I can't get you. Uh, live shows. You got to love it. Well, I like you guys, everybody out there. I'm trying to get the color of my screen fixed. Mm -hmm. It's still washed out. Hopefully. Jeff, I can't quite hear you, Jeff. You're still broken up. This is the okay. thing with How about uh, now? Can you hear me? I turned off my camera. And perfect. Let's, yeah, we've already seen your beautiful face. Let's talk. Talk about access in Hollywood and how, like, an idea is almost meaningless unless you have someone like William Shatner that can open doors. Yeah, no, that's no? a great, that's a really astute question because at the end of the day, it's a, uh, uh, it's a combination. Um, the idea, it, it's like actually like Thomas Edison says, uh, it, you know, it, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And I think that in, in startups and in Hollywood, it's the exact same thing. It's the, uh, uh, the idea is important, of course, but more important, in, in order to get something to go, you need you need money, um, and the key to getting money is often getting a package together. So the kind of the typical unit, if you're talking on a film side, is you need to have a script, uh, you need to have a director, and you need to have um, uh, you know a, a key piece of talent attached. And those are the three things that you go out to to go to go and try and get money. And then once you get the money, then that allows you to kind of, you know, move forward and green light the picture. And so, you know, it, it, it's not like a hard and fast rule. It, it, if you get the rock attached as talent, you don't need any of that other stuff. Right. You know, uh, if you get the money attached up front, then you don't need any of the other stuff. And so, like, it's, it's again, it's not like a formula, um, but that's kind of the way that you think about it. And it's, it, it's actually completely different on the films, or sorry, on the TV side. Uh, we recently sold our first series to a streamer uh to one of the, the big streamers and that's really exciting for us and in 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 that world um you have to have an idea and you've got to have a showrunner uh which is you know the person that is effectively going to run the show it's, it's usually you know the the primary writer and you know if it's a um if it's a brand new idea, you're going to have to build out probably at the very least like a season arc that shows like, you know, where this is going to go and what the main characters are. A lot of times you'll build out what's called a series Bible, which explains like all of the key elements so that, you know, that becomes kind of the key reference. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, if, 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 if it's an established property, like a, you know, like a series of books, for example, then you need to license the IP for those books. And that kind of becomes, in, in, in a little bit of a sense, your reference material. Like people can see where the story is going to go. So it, it, it is really tricky. And, you know, what you said up front, which is the, the, the value is not in the idea is 100% correct. You know, for all those people that come up and you're like, oh my God, you know, they stole my idea or, you know, like I've got a great idea for a show. What I tell people is that the idea itself is not valuable. 
right? It's not protectable. Um, and it's, it's not, there's literally just no value there. What you've got to do is you've got to build value and you build value by creating a script or you build value by selling somebody else on your idea, selling the rock on your idea. So he wants to attach to it. And the rock represents all those things that you need, you know, like the money, the share, all these things that you need to get the meeting. And, and if the rock is excited about it but, and keep in mind, everybody, the rock gets pitched a lot of ideas where we, you, oh know, my. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's so yeah no, I mean, for people, you know, for people in his position and there's a lot of people in Hollywood. I mean, obviously the rock is like, you know, the highest paid actor, I believe in Hollywood and, and somebody that, you know, he's kind of the, the quintessential example, but I mean, there's hundreds of people that, you know, Tom Hanks, Will Smith, Gal Gadot, you know, that just like just by signing on, you've got to go picture. Right. And and then there are thousands of people that are, you know, not at that level. But still, if you sign them on, you've got to go picture. And it may not be a go picture for a you know, two hundred dollar or two hundred million dollar movie. But, you know, it'll be a go picture for, you know, something that's a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's all. And like you said, those people are being every single person in the world knows that if the rock will endorse their idea you know whether it's a beer koozie company or like a new a new movie that wants to launch you know that that's gonna that that's the difference maker and so those people are obviously the hardest to get to they've got to put gatekeepers around themselves that are specifically designed because otherwise there's just not enough time in the day for them to listen to everybody that that, that wants to talk to them yeah and and even like look i'm I'm ultimately a nobody in this, in this business, but I get approached by my friends. I have an idea for a movie like, gosh, that I hate to tell I, I want you, know, I want to hear your ideas. You're my friend. I want to talk to you, but if you've not written it, if you don't have $10,000 or so to get it written by somebody good, I mean, I, there, are, there are people that go out and just buy options on things just to have it in case they ever want it. And they have a budget just to keep them optioned indefinitely and never, Never really any plan to make movies. We hear that story all the time. So yeah, yeah. that's that's after. Like someone's already done the work <laughs> to, to create yeah. something that's optionable. And even then it's like, yeah, whatever. You're adorable with your, uh, with your, if someone could write this, this will be amazing idea. It just doesn't work that way. All right. So I have purchased 10 shares of Legion M. It was $150 plus transaction fees, right? <laughs> I, intend to, I intend to, as I can, I might have meant of very modest means. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna increase that and do that. So what does that mean now? All right. So Pete owns ten shares. Obviously, in a in a multi million dollar company, that's that's a fingernail clipping, and you know not much. But 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 I own shares in a company. I also don't own I also don't own that much of uh, Microsoft. But you know yeah. I own I get the vote that kind of thing. So what does it mean now that I have these ten shares? Well, so it means that you're a shareholder and uh, basically, so our valuation as a company right now uh, is just south of $50 million, right? So the idea is like if somebody, you know, like that's the price of the company. And um, so it's it's fifty million dollars, which is in the you know it's kind of like if you thought of this as a, as a startup company, we're probably in like the Series B sort of you know uh, um, stage. Like this isn't like a brand new getting off the ground. You know we've been in business six years. You know we've got uh, you know I think we had uh, or we had over a million dollars of revenue last year. You know we we're, we're creating a track record. We just sold our first series and all that sort of stuff. But really what, so the question then becomes, what is the potential future value of Legion M? Because you own a percentage of it. And so, you know, if the, if, if it gets bigger, then, then the value of your shares goes up. And so the, the analogy that I would say is like, you know, if you look at Disney and I use Disney as an example, because everybody knows the company and, um, uh, um, uh, you know, it's it's in the same industry. I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to compare ourselves to Disney, you know, uh, but Disney is worth, I want to say it's like $350 billion. Wow. And so if you are looking at valuation as a size comparison um, and, and like looking at buildings, like thinking of like Legion M, that's a ground floor investment. So think of a building that's literally one story tall. If you were to look at Disney right next to it 
It is literally, I think it's like 15,000 stories high. It's larger than Mount Everest, right? It's, it's, it's almost like reaching out into the stratosphere. Like it's, it's just, there's absolutely no comparison. And so again, you know, I mean, who's to say what Legion M can do if, if we could become as big as Disney, which would probably take decades and A and B is an extreme long shot, right? Um, you know, then, then that's the potential sort of upside. I mean, it's just, you know, growing that little tiny house, that, that would be your investment, you know, growing into something that's, that's substantially larger. Um, and so, you know, but even if we have a tiny fraction of the success of Disney, um, you know, there's, there's serious potential upside. So, you know, like for us, our goal, Pete, is to get you at least a 10 X financial return on your money. Um, and you know, like I said, it's statistically the most likely outcome, even at this stage, even though that we've been in business for six years is probably that you would, you would lose it. Um, but you know, um, it, we're, we're taking a swing for the fence. And so, you know, like that's, that's what it's all about. Risk, risk, risk and reward. And and let's just say this out loud. Uh, You know, you, you can't promise incredible things as you talk on the internet. You have to say this could and likely will turn into zero. However, yeah. you're in the right space. Uh, the demand for content is only going up. The repurposing of content has only gone up. You know, like we, you would make a movie. Swamp Thing right now is playing somewhere live, you know, on, on some streaming platform. And, and Michael Uslin and his crew are making money, you know, on, on this movie that's almost 40 years old now, or if, not, if it's not already 40 years old. So that's... Um, you know, that that's an important thing to say out loud. I also want to say hey to my friend, Julie Taylor. She's going through a tough time. She lost her mom. And I think the world of, of Julie and, and I know she's watching right now. So, hey, Julie, I love you. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, we all lose people along the way. And, and, and it's just if you, if you have you, you know, that pain of losing a parent, of losing a sibling like I did last year. It's uh, uh, we're with you all the way, Julie. And let's keep uh, let's keep on going on and, and keep your head up and, and do that English thing. You are absolutely an English bros. So, uh, Jeff, I, I, I own these 10 shares. Do I have a share? Do I have a vote in what movie projects we take on? Like, can I just be like, thumbs up? We yeah, are. yeah. Well, so so uh, we have multiple ways. Uh, we have an app um, that's going on right now called Film Scout uh, that allows you to help us. I'm at South by Southwest. I'm checking out films here to see if there's anything that we might get involved with. Um, there's multiple projects that we've got involved with before out of festivals. Never. This is our first time at South by, but uh, at, from uh, Sundance, we we bought a film a couple of years ago with Screen Media, uh, and we partnered with Bleecker Street on another film. And so, anyway, Film Scout is an app that you can download on your phone. I mean, frankly, anybody in the it, you know uh, can do it. You don't have to be a shareholder uh, 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 to do that. Um, and we help. We we created this game. It's actually a really fun game that allows you to help rate and. Evaluate evaluate all the films that are playing at the festival. And it does two things. One is it gives you uh, like a direct voice and saying like, I like this. I don't like this. You know, let your, 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 let your opinions be known. Um, But it also gives us data as a company that allows us to make smarter decisions you know, with your money. And so right. it's, it, it's a really wonderful sort of virtuous cycle. And the whole thing is fun to play. Like we've actually set it up as a competition where at the end of it, you can see uh, how you score as a film scout, how good of a job you do um, uh, scouting and predicting the success of the films uh, at the festival. And uh, anyway, so that's, that, that's one. We have another tool called Impulse, uh, which it, it usually takes a couple of weeks uh, to get through the process, but you'll get a welcome email from Legion M when your investment closes, when we actually get the money, because uh, right now the platform has it uh, in their escrow. And, uh, and that is where we're always going out to our community to, you know, put log lines and ideas and sometimes trailers, depending on what the project is. And, and again, it, it all comes back to this idea of we, we believe we've got 35,000, well now 35,001. Uh, thank you, Pete. And, uh, uh, you guys are so much smarter than myself or Paul or any of us. And so, you know, we try and leverage that as much as we can um, in conjunction with, you know, we, we always talk about the fact that a legion of fans we think is the best possible source of information on what's good and what's hot and what people are interested in. But when it comes to Hollywood, there's the whole 
business of Hollywood side, which is extremely challenging. Um, it's nuanced, it's confidential. And so that's why we've got people like William Shatner, Michael Uslin. Uh, we have an amazing advisory board with executives from Netflix and Sony and Lucasfilm um, and you know uh, film distribution companies that allow us to navigate kind of the business of Hollywood. Like these are the people that you can't trust and can't trust. And this is a good deal or a bad deal. And so it's really, it's, it, it's those two. It, it's what the fans want with what the advisors are telling us. And, and those are the two halves of the balance that we use to steer the ship, so to speak. And let me just tell you that, you know, I don't want to say Hollywood's full of a bunch of bad people. because There's incredible people in Hollywood. There's also some incredible people like, I got lucky to get my start. I couldn't do it that way again right now. When they see someone like you guys come along, they want it to succeed and they're going to help out. But if you come out there like a rube with a bag full of money, they will take it from you. <laughs> yeah, there is no shortage of sharks in Hollywood. Like it's a, it's a very competitive, very complicated from a business standpoint. It is a well-established yeah. market. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it is. And, and I think the thing is, a lot of people come out to Hollywood and they get stars in their eyes about, you know, because every anybody can look at a film. When you look at, at an idea, somebody pitches you on a project, it's always an amazing idea. And when you're talking to people, you know, oh, about all the success that they've had and all the this and the that. But it's like, you know, again, it, it takes some time to kind of tune your meter and be able to understand when people are, are you know, telling you the flat out truth versus you know exaggerating or spinning versus like flat out lying and you've got to deal yeah. with all that so there's also a version of of the truth when they absolutely say what they mean to say but the capacity isn't there to follow through like yeah i'd love to do that yeah, let me know when you're ready or i will do this for sure but timing is a monster and it's, oh you yeah. know what i'm working i already have a contract i already got paid i'm you yeah. know this will have to wait. And that can go two, three, four, five, six, you ten year, you know, on yeah. and on. Michael Uslin's first Batman movie, ten years. Ten, ten years, years. Yeah. He had to will that thing into production. Ford, Ford versus Ferrari. He had the uh, screenwriter for that guy. One, he had to share a screenwriting credit with with you know with other people to get it made, which is fine, right? That's how you do it. And and he had to will primarily by himself until he could gather enough engines to make that fantastic movie, which was Oscar grade happen, you know? And then you're like, okay, I've put all that energy into this. Now what am I going to do? Oh crap. You know, now I got to find a new project, you know, and you know, they always have something, but it is not, it is not as easy. Actually, I would say every movie is an impossible dream. Even it is the next DC or Marvel movie, you know, they've got all that energy. Most of the ideas they come up with don't get made. Yeah, no, that is 100% true. It's, you know, we were very fortunate. One of the first people that we met, we had an opportunity to sit down with Guillermo del Toro, you know, very early on with Legion M. And, um, you know, the thing that he told us is nothing ever happens. It, you know, like you have to make every single thing happen. And like, I, I feel like that is such good advice. And, Again, like as entrepreneurs and people that are fluent in startups, like we totally identify with that because it's yeah. the same thing when you're trying to build a company. But it's, it's yeah, like the, there's just no way to better state it. Like nothing happens on its own. Like it only happens because you make it happen. And yeah, yeah. yeah. The natural, you know, order is to move towards chaos. <laughs> yeah. I know movie TV was a success, but do you feel like you were also ahead of the market on that one too? Um, well, it, you know, it, not necessarily, uh, you know, Moby TV was successful because we were the first ones to market and we yeah. owned that market and where Moby TV eventually stumbled, you know, we founded the company in 99. We won our Emmy in 2003, um, you know, cause we launched, you know, about the projects this, th that we launched. Um, and then I left the company in 2008, I think, uh, or maybe 2009, it was 2009. And um, they almost went public in 2011, uh, but it didn't work out. And then in 2022, they actually had to declare bankruptcy and, and close down the company, which was a you know, huge disappointment. But so if you look at that arc, I mean, it was a 23 year arc, you know, and I was, you know, I was in it for the first, you know, almost half of it. 
And then I was still had had sight into it, you know, in, in, in the second half of, of it. And I think really the challenge with that company was, was that we were the first ones in the space. We were putting TV on a phone when people were saying, that's dumb. Nobody's ever going to watch that. And then, you know, over the course of 23 years, we went from being an innovative startup company to competing with Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, yeah. like, you know, all of these players. Like, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an industry that has been more disruptive, more disrupted over the last 10 or 15 years than media and especially television and mobility. And so, you know, it's like, it's, it's tough. In retrospect, there are clear things that we wish that we did. One of them is we wish we sold the company. You know, we had an opportunity to sell the company. In, I don't know. It was like, I want to say 2007, 2008. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a huge media company, like one of the big networks that you know, uh, approached us and was interested in buying it. And, you know, at the time, you know, we had different ideas and, and um, I don't remember all the things that went into it, but, but it didn't end up happening. So it's, you know, it's one of those things, woulda, coulda, shoulda, but it's, yeah. I feel like in that case, the fact that we were early really helped us. I think in the case of the New York Rock Exchange, we were just too early and, you know, and, and again, if we, I think if I had launched that company three years later, we might be the Dapper Labs now of, um, you know, the music NFTs. We were talking to universal music. I mean, think about that. Think about taking that Dapper Labs model, applying it to is like universal music that owns like you know probably 40 percent of the worldwide you know music catalog and the ability to issue shares for songs ranging yeah. from Lil Wayne to Beatles right like it's just amazing yeah no it is it is hey listen I've had you for an hour and it's been great and uh, let's not take years and years in between episodes uh, I want to have you come back on uh, anything in closing from you no, I, I mean, thank you so much uh, for having me on the show. It's always such a delight to talk to uh, to, to you and to John. Um, and uh, yeah, for anybody that's listening, that's interested in joining Legion M, um, you can always invest. You can also join for free. Uh, you just go to legionm.com. You can join as a free member. Uh, there's no cost. There's no obligation. It's a great way to kind of see what it's all about, you know, get to get to know what you're getting into we've got a round that'll probably be closing pretty soon and you know um but uh yeah come check it out and like i said join the fan owned revolution man we can uh we can unite we can do anything i love it stand by